In this lecture and the following one, we will be talking about the counsel of God. Uh, when people need to change, they often don't know which direction to go or how to get there from here. And so, as we have seen many people, especially in our society, especially non-Christians, uh, the first place to go when you've got a problem in your life that you can't fix is you go to a therapist, you go to a psychologist, a counselor. And many Christians have uh, followed this practice as well, not infrequently they go to secular counselors assuming that a trained psychologist is the best bet uh, for seeking counsel uh, from somebody who can really understand what's going on with you and how to fix that. There are some Christians, however, who feel a little bit squeamish about going to non-Christian counselors, so they go to Christian counselors. Now, Christian counselors fall into two categories. There are those that are basically dressed up psychological counselors. Not very dressed up. They dress up their language a little bit with Christian knees and and uh, they might talk about prayer and they might talk about scripture a little bit. But sometimes they don't even bother with that because the real light, they believe, comes from psychology and that's what they really espouse and use in their practice, though they are Christians. There is also a movement of Christian counseling uh, that talks about neuthetic counseling. This is uh, the movement that was launched by the publication of Jay Adams' book, Competent to Counsel, back in 1970. And this, is a, this movement rejects psychology altogether and is in favor of what they call biblical counseling. And there are counseling centers and trained counselors and so forth who have been taught to counsel from the Scripture. Uh, there's yet a third almost rebel movement against that. That is that of, that the Bobgans are involved in. Uh, they've written a book, I believe it's called Against Biblical Counseling for the Bible. And what they have suggested is that the whole idea of having professional counselors, biblical or otherwise, is unbiblical. And that uh, counsel should come directly from the Bible, not from people who were trained how to counsel uh, from the Bible. Uh, they believe that uh, the idea of having professional counselors who charge for their services, for example, and this is the case uh, with most counselors, Christian or otherwise, um, is that they are charging for the Word of God. They're, that this is uh, supposed to be ministry, they say, and this should be done by pastors and elders and older brothers and sisters in the church, not by professionals, even if those professionals have been trained professionally to use the Bible in counseling. So, the Bob Gants have actually gone a step further than even just the biblical counseling movement to say that, you know, you don't even need people who are trained biblical counselors. Now, I'm not sure. I have not read the Bob Gants book on that subject. I've read some of their books, but not that one. So I'm not really sure to what degree I would agree or disagree with them. Bob Gant is their last name. B-O-B-G-A-N is the last name. It's Martin and Deidre Bob Gant. <clears throat> they wrote Cycle Heresy and Prophets of Cycle Heresy, books one and two. They wrote How to Counsel from Scripture. Uh, they wrote uh, The Psychological Way and the Spiritual Way and uh, several other books. Most, uh, all the books of theirs that I've read have been very good. Um, but they have made this turn against biblical counseling as a profession uh, since the last time I read one of their books. And I have not read their most, I don't know if this is their most recent book, but it is more recent than the ones I've read. And it is entitled, I think, Against Biblical Counseling for the Bible. And they're essentially, I believe the position they're taking is that, that any Christian, uh, can, with the Word of God and with the Holy Spirit, can, can sort out the problems of life and can give counsel to others without uh, having a professional label to it and without professionalizing the ministry. Now, I don't know what all of their complaints are. I would, I would have to say... I myself have strong convictions against charging for the Word of God, and therefore I'm, I, what I've heard that they say secondhand sort of resonates with me, but uh, I will not come out in favor of their book on that without knowing exactly what it is they're saying. Uh, I will say this, though, <clears throat> that I'm not, I don't really object to certain Christian people being trained how to counsel from Scripture. Uh, if I had any particular objection to the Christian counseling or even the biblical counseling movement, it would be uh, this whole idea that it may perpetuate the notion that people need to be somehow professionally trained, whether they're professionally trained at counsel from the Bible or from psychology or something else. The idea that it requires a professional, someone with special training, is, uh, is a concept that I'm not particularly eager to see perpetuated. 
also the idea of charging for it, and there's some being a professional. Uh, I, I'm not very pleased with, although pastors usually charge as well. I mean, not for their counseling, but they receive a salary for being their pastors in many cases. And uh, I guess my objection to a, a person charging for biblical counsel would probably have to extend, uh, if I were to be consistent, to the whole idea of pastors being salaried too. Uh, well, I don't. It's not my business to go around criticizing how other men do their ministries, as so long as they're uh, they're not in gross violation of some <clears throat> biblical truth. And so, I'm not going to come against the biblical counseling movement. Of course, I am against the Christian psychology movement for the simple reason that it's a misnomer. There is no such thing as Christian psychology. <clears throat> there is such a thing as the counsel of God. And whether a person is trained in some kind of school or counseling center on how to give counsel from the Bible or not, a person may receive all the counsel they need for life from the resources that God has provided. And there may be some advantage in taking some people aside and who don't know a thing about how to counsel from Scripture and telling them how to apply Scripture to people's situations so they can help more people in the church. Sadly, if this is necessary, it is only because of a general biblical illiteracy in the church uh, because Paul was convinced, he said, in Romans chapter 15, that his readers were full of wisdom, full of goodness, and able to counsel one another. He said, now these people were not specially trained, they were just your ordinary Christians who knew God, they walked in the Spirit, they knew the Word of God, and that was all that they apparently needed, said Paul. I'm referring to um, Romans 15, verse 14. Paul said, Now I myself am confident concerning you, my brethren, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able to admonish one another. And J. Adams has pointed out that that word, able to admonish, that phrase can be translated competent to counsel. So, <clears throat> I believe that it is a, a token and an evidence of the biblical shallowness and illiteracy of Christians in general, that there seems to appear to be a need for people to be specially trained on how to use the Bible in counsel. One of the problems I have, although I'm not sh I, this is not an insurmountable problem, but one of the problems I have with the idea of uh, taking people who don't know how to counsel from Scripture and giving them training on how to counsel from Scripture is that the reason they were originally not able to counsel from Scripture must be that they don't have a thoroughgoing knowledge of the Scripture because anyone who does, anyone who walks with God and knows the Bible well, will have no difficulty counseling from Scripture without special training. And if you take such a person with that general illiteracy level and put them in a class on how to counsel from Scripture, what they may learn is techniques. What they may learn is pat answers. And I've never been one to appreciate pat answers, even if they're true in many cases. I'm afraid pat answers just don't ring true many times. And if you just you know, decide, okay, when a person has anxiety, you give them this scripture. When a person has depression, you give them that scripture. And when someone has you know, uh, relational problems, you give them that scripture. That may be a valid thing to do in terms of addressing the area of ignorance or of disobedience in their life. But it seems to me like a more total understanding of the Bible, not just having a few proof texts here and there for different points, uh, a fuller understanding of the Bible is going to be better equipment for addressing people's needs from a, you know, a holistically biblical perspective than, um, than would uh, you know, individual uh, verses handed out like, uh, like uh, aspirins. Now, <clears throat> sometimes those of us who believe that the whole need of counselees, so to speak, I don't really like the word counselees, but I guess that is a good word if someone's getting counseled. That the whole need of counselees is found in Scripture. This view is sometimes mocked by Christian psychologists. They say you just can't give out Bible verses like aspirins to people. Or as Larry Crabb, I believe it was, who said uh, to, do, to give out Scriptures and to remind people of the love of God and so forth when they're hurting, is sometimes just like handing out recipes to people standing in a food line. You know, you're not really giving them anything substantial, uh, even though they have a hunger. And the blasphemous implications of his statement was their hunger can be fulfilled with psychology, but not with Scripture. <coughs> but I just want to say that I do believe that Scripture has all the answers. I don't believe that we are helped by uh, simply printed words on a page, however. I don't think that by reading a scripture and chanting it as a mantra 
that that's going to make problems go away. The reason that the scripture holds the answers is because the scripture reveals the truth. And it's the truth that will make you free, Jesus said. And it is not so much that you know the right Bible verse. It's the question of whether you have processed and are living by and trusting it and believing the truth that is in that Bible verse. I've heard people say, well, I have anxiety and I, and I know the Bible verse that says, uh, casting all your cares on him for he cares for you. And I know that verse that says, be anxious for nothing, but in all things by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God and the peace of God which passes understanding, will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. I, I know that. I've said my prayers, but I still have anxiety. So I guess the Bible doesn't work. Well, the Bible doesn't work that way, that's for sure. It doesn't work if you just read a verse and, in a perfunctory manner, say a, a routine prayer and say, well, that's supposed to get it done, isn't it? The Bible is not a magic book. It's a book of God revealing His counsel, His truth, which will set you free, not by simply reading the information, but by living by the truth that is there. When that lady I mentioned earlier who uh, years ago an older lady lived in a, a Christian community house that I and my second wife were living in and the woman was a very depressed woman co continually seeing pastors and counselors about this and that. And she asked me, Steve, where do you go when you need counseling? When you need counseling, where do you, where do you go? And I felt so embarrassed although I shouldn't have but I felt embarrassed saying I don't go anywhere for counsel." The reason I felt embarrassed is I, A, I was in a church at that time that, that, in, that indicated that to have an independent spirit is a bad thing and that the healthiest thing you can do is acknowledge your dependency on the body of Christ and if you think you can handle your problems, just you, you and God alone, uh, you probably got this uh, independent spirit and it's a bad deal, it's unhealthy. <clears throat> well, the fact of the matter is I have been able to handle all my problems between me and God. Uh, I mean... Uh, at least uh, the kinds of problems people go to counselors for. I mean, I have other kinds of problems, financial and health and things like that from time to time that, uh, that other members of the body of Christ I'm, I'm very dependent on. And as far as learning and doctrine and stuff, I depend heavily on the body of Christ for things like that. But when it comes to dealing with crises in my life, I have happily needed no one other than God. In all my 44 years of walking with God, I've never needed another human being to pull me out of the slew of despond and I'm not saying that as a boast and that's the other reason I felt embarrassed saying it it sounded to me like I might sound like I'm boasting and I didn't intend to boast I just wanted to tell the truth I don't go to counselors I, it's not like I would, never would it's just that I have never needed them because the word of God is my counselor Jesus is my counselor now that doesn't mean that when I have uh, when I'm prone to depression and sometimes I am or when I'm prone to be anxious or tempted to be anxious and sometimes I am or angry uh, you know, when all those bad things are upon me, it doesn't mean that I just quote a relevant Bible verse and it all goes away. What it means is that by application of the truth of Scripture, which comes from knowing the Scripture and believing the Scripture and being committed to obeying the Scripture, God has been able in my life to consistently do all that he has said he will do. And that is to maintain in me a sound mind in the midst of crises and so forth. And I am a very strong believer that the counsel of God is adequate. And as we saw earlier, there is among Christian psychologists, uh, um, the integrationists, you know, I, I refer to them as those who advocate the, the view of the inadequacy of Scripture. But evangelicals ought to believe in the adequacy of not of Scripture per se, but of the truth of God, which we gain from the Scripture. We don't have, a, I hope, a superstitious idea about this printed book. Our idea is that God in this book has revealed himself. He has given his word. His word is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It is that word and that truth which is revealed in the Scriptures that is there for our learning. We don't give out, I hope, Bible verses like aspirins. Though I will say this, sometimes a Bible verse, if the truth in it is apprehended, works far better than an aspirin. In fact, sometimes it's all that's needed <coughs> to readjust a person's thinking. Remember, a psychologist is not addressing a sickness. He's teaching somebody. Uh, a, a, he's a talk therapist. He doesn't use chemicals. He's not dealing with a, a bodily or chemical condition. He is he is simply counseling. He's simply giving, uh, uh, he's trying to shift the patient's view of things. 
And if the psychiatrist or psychologist is not a Christian, then his view of things is not necessarily going to be as it should be. And what the Bible is there to do is indeed to renew our minds, to change our view of things, to give us a new way of understanding what we're going through and what our reactions are to be in it. I've given you a handout that has the outline of most of what I want to say in these lectures. I begin by pointing out my conviction, and I think that it is self-evident that this is so, that the appeal to psychology and the wisdom of man by Christians gives evidence that Christians have forgotten, neglected, or rejected three things, three facts. One is the spiritual nature of man's state and warfare. Man's problems are not psychological in the sense that psychologists usually think of that word. Man's problems are spiritual. The reason that a person is has a messed up life is because that person has a messed up relationship with God. Now, you might say, wait, are you saying that good Christians don't ever have depression or anxiety or whatever? Of course good Christians have those things sometimes. They have to struggle with them. So did Jesus. Jesus, No temptation has taken you, but such is a common man. And Jesus was tempted in all ways as well. I'm sure he was tempted to depression. I'm sure he was tempted to anxiety. I'm sure he was tempted to anger. And, I mean, temptation is one thing. Of course good Christians have temptation. The question is how they deal with it. What do they do with it? Do, Do they allow this thing to affect their behavior? Or do they simply go on steady? with God and do what's right and and rejoice in the Lord even though they're suffering uh, from various uh, mood afflictions. That is the question. If a person's relationship is right with God, then they're all is well with their soul. When all is not well in the soul, and that's what the psyche is, suki in the Greek is soul, Psychology is the study of the soul. If, not as, if all is not all right in the soul, then the problem is spiritual. It has to do with a problem in the relationship with God. And yes, good Christians can have problems in their relationship with God. They shouldn't. They needn't. But they sometimes can and do. And where there is misbehavior and God dishonoring uh, thinking going on and, and feeling, then there is usually something, I shouldn't say usually, I believe invariably, something wrong. Something that is that has caused their relationship with God to not be all that it should be. It may simply be that they're not trusting God. It may be more complex than that. It may be that there's unresolved guilt over something they've done, and they know they've done it, and God knows they've done it, but they haven't repented of it. There may be different things. <clears throat> I don't mean to say it all resolved to one of those two things, but those are two very important factors. But the spiritual nature of man's state and warfare is apparently not being taken into adequate consideration by those who want to bring in psychology and the wisdom of man as a cure. Since the wisdom of man and psychology cannot address issues of spiritual warfare, the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. And they're foolishness to him because they're spiritually discerned. And psychologists are not, I mean, those who have developed psychological theories are not Christians. None of the basic 250 psychotherapies, none of them was developed by a Christian. Therefore, all of them came from us, to us from natural men who cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God. How can one hope that they will be able to address spiritual issues? It's interesting, I have there an example in the handout. It comes from Minerva Meyer's book, Happiness is a Choice. Minerva and Meyer, uh, formerly a team, uh, a psychologist and a psychiatrist, both of them Christians, ran uh, the Minerva Meyer clinics and wrote many books together. They're definitely integrationists. <clears throat> and I believe, although Paul Meyer, as I said, meditates four hours a day on Scripture, I don't know which Scriptures he meditates on, but the things he says are not necessarily scriptural in many cases. But in their book, Happiness is a Choice, Minerva and Meyer point out that depression has come to be called America's number one health problem. Notice, health problem, not spiritual problem. It, however, they point out that it occurs twice as frequently in females as in males. Now, that could still be, that could be, you know, hormonal, of course. Women have different chemistry than men. And if we want to say that depression is a result of chemical imbalance, the fact that it occurs twice as often in women as in men might, might support that notion. But look at this next fact. 
depression occurs three times as frequently in the higher socioeconomic groups. Now, depression is supposedly a sickness, a health problem, yet it occurs three times more frequently in the higher socioeconomic groups. Does that not tell you that it is a socioeconomic uh, you know, thing, not a medical thing? It's not medical. Now, why would depression occur more often, three times as often, in the higher socioeconomic groups? In other words, among Americans, you don't find depression, such as Americans so frequently complain of, uh, so you don't find that so much in Latin America. You don't find that in you know, uh, tribal Africa. You don't find that problem so much in the non-industrialized, poorer countries. Why do you suppose that is? Is it because they don't have as many problems as Americans have? I dare say they have more problems than we have. In many cases, their lives hang in the balances day by day. They're not sure how they're going to live. But they don't have the problems of depression we do. What do you suppose the problem is? Is it possible that those who are of the more affluent West have simply become more pampered, more wimpy, more spoiled, and more dependent on continual gratification for their happiness? Is this a medical condition or a spiritual condition? To me, the answer is self-evident. By asking the question, it is answered automatically. But maybe not all would agree with my diagnosis, but it seems to me obvious this is not a medical problem. This is a, uh, this, it's the spiritual nature of man's state and of man's warfare that is being ignored by those who want to import man's wisdom and uh, psychology into the enterprise of helping Christians cope with crises and problems in their lives. A second thing that I believe is being ignored, and this is very closely related to the first, is the moral, not medical, nature of mental and bodily misbehavior. Now, this is, of course, sort of the corollary of the first. Man's problem and man's state, well, man's state and his warfare is spiritual in nature. Therefore, his misbehavior and his problems are not of a medical sort. They are of a moral sort. I have a quote here from Dr. Peter Bregan from Toxic Psychiatry. He's talking about anxiety, which, by the way, he tells us, uh, someone, the American Psychological Association or someone like that, uh, uh, some group like that, has uh, labeled anxiety as the uh, major, I, I forget exactly how it's put, something like the, the medical crisis of the 90s or something like that. It is, it is this decade's great crisis of, in, in the health of Western peoples. Uh, they don't even say m mental health. Uh, that anxiety is apparently more of a more frequently found in Americans than any other alleged health condition inside or outside the mental health field. And, of course, we're told by the psychiatrists, most of them, about anxiety, the same thing we're told about depression or, or bipolar affective disorder or about anger or about a whole bunch of other things. Namely, that is a chemical problem. It's a chemical imbalance in the brain. The psychiatrists want you to believe that because they're the only people around who can prescribe drugs uh, for these kinds of things. Of course, an ordinary medical doctor can too, but people who have uh, anxiety or depression, though they sometimes go to their regular family physician, they also more likely probably go to psychiatrists. And so the psychiatrists would like you to think that they have found a chemical cause for this. It's not a moral problem. You know, it, throughout history, Christians have believed that anxiety or worry is a, is a spiritual problem because the Bible tells us that the peace of God is the normal state of mind for the Christian who is following in his thinking and his living biblical truth. To be anxious for nothing is a command of Scripture. And the way to be anxious for nothing is also outlined in Scripture. However, nowadays when Christians are anxious, someone's willing to tell them it's not a moral problem. You're not disobeying God. You've got a medical problem here. Uh, Peter Bregan says, quote, The biological basis for anxiety overwhelm is so flimsy that one recent textbook, The New Harvard Guide to Psychiatry, gives it only a paragraph and labels the exclusively biological approach as an extreme theoretical position that fails to take psychological facts into account. The American Psychiatric Press textbook of psychiatry 
does discuss various biological hypotheses as promising, but it endorses none in particular. In 1988, Comprehensive Textbook of Psychiatry makes clear that the data are preliminary, conclusions are tentative, and no biological cause for anxiety has been determined. Despite all the hopes for finding a genetic basis of anxiety disorders, none has been demonstrated, unquote. Now, this is not from a Christian. This is from a, uh, an unbeliever who is a psychiatrist and writes books on this subject, several books. And yet this is very contrary to what the ordinary psychiatrist would like to, you to believe. This is not a medical problem. This is not a chemical problem. You don't need a drug for this. It's a spiritual, moral problem. And the third thing that I think is being ignored or forgotten, neglected or rejected by those Christians who are trying to bring psychology into their counseling is the supernatural Christ nature of Christianity as God's solution. This is the one I'd like to lay the heaviest emphasis upon. There is a very low level of confidence in Christianity and the supernatural nature of Christianity to solve the problems of the human soul. Among Christians, there is a low level of confidence in Christianity's supernatural qualities. Now, why would there be such a low level of confidence? Well, obviously, if there was a, a lot of demonstration around us of Christians who are facing the same crises and problems that the worldly people and their neighbors are facing, but the Christians, by appeal to Jesus Christ and the Scriptures alone, are victorious in these things and are not disabled by them and function profitably and fruitfully in life and happily in life despite these things and they have nothing but Jesus and the supernatural aid that comes through the Holy Spirit. If there was a lot of that going on and people could see that in the church, there would be no temptation to say we need psychology added to our Christianity to help people in these crises. It is obvious that the frequency with which we hear this claim that the Bible alone is not adequate, that Christianity alone is not good enough unless we supplement it with psychological theories and nonsense, that claim only exists because there is such a rarity of Christians living Christianly. There is such a rarity of Christians who are walking in the power of the Spirit, full confidence in God, Dying to self, that's the biggest one. I think there's a lot of Christians who want to say they believe God with all their hearts, love God with all their hearts, but they've never heard of or dreamed of or don't ever attempt to die to themselves. Because they're told that's not the right thing to do. The Christians are telling you the same thing the world is telling you about that. Don't die to yourself, affirm yourself. But until someone dies to themselves, as we've talked about in our previous lectures, they're really going to struggle. They're not going to be Christians. I mean, they're really not going to be Christians because to follow Jesus, you have to deny yourself, the Bible says. You can't live a Christian life until you get to that point. I'm not saying you can't be saved and forgiven. You just can't follow Jesus unless you first deny yourself. And it is the case that the supernatural power of the Christian gospel to meet every psychological, spiritual need of the individual that power has not been demonstrated as it ought to be in the church. This is not, however, a deficiency in the truthfulness of the claims of Christianity. This is a deficiency in the truthfulness and the integrity and the commitment of Christians. There's one famous historian who said, the claims of Jesus have not been tried and found wanting. They've been found difficult and not tried. And that is, to a large extent, the problem in the church. The church, the problem in the church is not that Christianity is now outmoded. We've outgrown it as a society, as a culture. We, we know better than to look just to Christianity. That was an old-fashioned way that Christians used to think. Now we have science. We have evolution. We have psychology. We have, you know, everything now that uh, this, all this knowledge from science that supplements us. We realize that just believing the Bible and just believing like Christians always used to believe that, that Jesus can solve all your problems... That's just old-fashioned, and, and, and we really need to, to include a lot of the light that comes from the world uh, so that we can really f function better. No one would be saying that if Christians were committed, trusting, and loving God with all their heart and dead to self. Now, the statement I just made, if anyone hears this tape who is committed to Christian psychology, 
they're going to say, I am the most callous, I'm the most uncompassionate uh, person who could ever address such subjects. They're going to say, Steve, what you're saying is damaging. This is dangerous stuff. You're going to take people who are in crisis and make them feel guilty and make them feel like they've got a spiritual problem. There's something wrong between them and God. What these people need to do is be affirmed that everything is well between them and God. They just have a medical, mental illness. Well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I've just got to go with what God says. And I don't care if everyone else says otherwise. The Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar. I don't know anybody who's living a perfect life. And therefore, I don't know anyone who could be told that there is everything is as right with God as could possibly be, notwithstanding the fact that you're in crisis, depression, and, and, and anxiety all the time, overwhelmed with panic and so forth. I mean, uh, it might be so that we don't want to heap guilt on people. But you see, the gospel doesn't heap guilt. The Bible relieves guilt. The Bible starts requiring us to acknowledge our guilt, our responsibility, that we are the ones who are the problem, that our relationship with God has been damaged, and we have been damaged by the loss of the relationship with God. And then, that's not where the gospel stops. The Bible isn't a message of condemnation. The Bible is a message of deliverance and freedom and liberation. And the Bible offers us the only possible hope for change. It is not uncompassionate to tell a person who's dying that he's got diabetes if what he needs is insulin. And he won't take the insulin unless he knows he has diabetes. It may not be the news he wants to hear. He might rather be told he's just fine. All he needs to eat is more chocolate and he'll be, feel much better. But that is not compassionate to ignore the fact that the man is in bad shape. And there is a cure. And Christianity alone... The Bible alone is God's answer to what the shape is we're in and why we're in that shape and what's to be done about it. And I am a, I'm totally convinced. And, I, you know, people, if anyone wants to say that people who take a position like mine must live in some kind of ivory tower free from the trials and sorrows and so forth of ordinary people, that person simply doesn't know who I am or where I've been or what I've been through. I will say that I wish that those people could have been with me. I, if they had been, I hope they would keep their mouth shut because I wouldn't have anything to gain from what they think. But I, w I wish, I think they would have something to gain by seeing how people who have nothing but Jesus and nothing but confidence in God and the Word of God can handle the same crises that they think people need psychological counseling for. An example of this that comes out is that in their book, Happiness is a Choice, Minerth and Meyer. Uh, spin out that same old yarn about the five stages of grieving. You know that, the five stages of grieving. It's a psychological concept that a normal person, this is how they put it, they say all, every normal person who experiences a significant loss goes through five stages of grieving. Now, that statement in itself tells you that if you don't go through five stages of grieving when you experience a significant loss, you're not normal. Maybe you need a counselor. You know, because if you're normal, you'll go through these five stages of grieving. All normal people do. What are the five stages of grieving? The first is denial. I heard this again as recently as yesterday on the tape by some Christian I was listening to. Someone, I don't know who the person is or who gave me the tape. I found it in my car and was curious about it, threw it in there. And this lady, obviously a Christian, was uh, affirming the five stages of grieving as something everyone goes through when they lose their parent, when they lose someone significant to them. And <clears throat> the first stage is denial. Then these are listed a little differently by different people. The second one is, I think, anger turned inward. Angry at yourself. When you stop denying that you've had the loss, you begin to blame yourself. Then anger turned outward. Being angry at others. Maybe even angry at God. And then you've got weeping. And then you've got, you come to a place of resolution where you're going you're gonna to cope with it. You're going to manage it. You're going you're gonna to survive this one. You've been through denial. You've been through anger turned inward. You've been through anger turned outward. You've been through the, the emotional breakdown of weeping and shedding tears. And now you can stand and face the world and live in the real world again. How long does it take to go through these five stages of grieving? It depends on how good your therapist is. He can help you through it. But you will go through it if you're normal. Well, I guess I'm not very normal. I have suffered significant losses of various types, and 
uh, one of the very classic types had a wife who was killed in an accident, as you know. And uh, that's, that's considered to be a significant loss. It certainly was significant to me. But the fact of the matter, and I don't say this with any kind of, uh, I mean, this is not a boast, this is just the facts, man. I, I never denied it. I never got angry at myself. I never got angry at God or anyone else. I, I did, I guess I jumped immediately to the fourth stage that we did, I, my, my daughter and I did weep a bit on occasions for a day or two. The first day or two, there were times when, when there were tears, when we realized that my wife was uh, dead. But, but that, you know, that was not protracted. You know, we pulled ourselves together and realized that, you know, God's in charge and, and my wife is in heaven and, you know, we, we lived without the benefit of her presence before we knew her and we can do it again with God. There was just, I mean, there was nothing there. There was no counseling. There was no therapy. No need for it. There was God. And there was the truth. And now see, there are actually, the, the way that the psychologists prove their point, if I said, well, I never even went through denial, they're, they're not going to say, well, then I guess not everyone does go through the five stages of, of grieving. You know what they'd say? They'd say, you're still in denial. Because you're, st- you're, you're denying that, that you, you, if you haven't had anger yet, if you haven't had anger turned outward and inward, you're still in denial. In fact, when, uh, when my wife was killed, there was such abundance of grace on my life. Now, practically everyone in the church came to my home within the next two days to comfort me. But as it turned out, they, many of them were comforted by, by being with me. I was, I, was, uh, I was in the grace of God. I mean, it was really... A supernatural thing. That's what I'm saying. Christianity has a supernatural aspect that the Christian psychologists don't apparently know about. Don't credit, or they simply deny it. There was supernatural grace, and that grace never went away. A lot of people said, well, you're in, uh, you're in a psychological shock. I think that was another word for denial. You're kind of in shock. When people go through these things, uh, they're in shock for a while. And sometimes it's a month or two, and, and, and it just begins to dawn on them, and then, and then it comes down crushing. So be ready to... Uh, you know, to have someone near you who can counsel you or something when just count on it. The next month or two, something's going you know, to come crashing in on you. Never came crashing in on me. The reason is I never denied it. I accepted it. It's not what I wanted, but I had no choice. I accepted it from the hand of God. I said, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job didn't go through denial. He got angry, I will say that, but he didn't go through the five stages of grieving. Lots of people do go through those things, I'm sure psychologists have reasons for saying that people all go through that thing. You've got to remember, though, that psychologists can only derive their data from their case load, you know, from, the, from, the, from their patients. They see 10,000 patients going through grieving and they systematize what seems to be common to most of them. They go through these five stages, apparently. I will not deny that most people may go through those five stages. The problem we have to remember is that psychological theories are based upon observation of psychological patients. And who is to say that the psychological patient, the person running off to a therapist, is the normal person? Now, more and more, of course, therapy is being mainstreamed, you know, and more and more people who are really normal are being told they should go to see therapy. Uh, But as a matter of fact, these theories are developed largely uh, not from uh, from talking to well-adjusted people, certainly not from spiritual Christians, but from people who don't know how to cope, and they go to a therapist. And then the therapist derives norms on the basis of the average or the typical patients that he sees. And he says, this is now normal. Well, if psychiatric and and, uh, psychotherapeutic patients are the normal person, then maybe this is true. I won't, I'm not in in a position to deny that the average person who doesn't know God doesn't know the truth, and doesn't have the Holy Spirit, that I'm not going to deny that they go through those five stages. Maybe they do. I'm sure there's some basis for that theory. But what I'm saying is for a, a couple of Christian authors, Minerth and Meyer, to say all normal people go through this. And just yesterday, some lady I was listening to, obviously a psychologist, said the same thing. She was a Christian. I thought, Good heavens, don't these people read their Bibles? Mr. Meyer ought to meditate uh, a little bit on First Thessalonians chapter 4. Since he's got four hours a day to meditate on Scripture, maybe he ought to meditate on this chapter. Because in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13, 
Paul said, but I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, that is, those who have died, lest you would sorrow or grieve as others who have no hope. In other words, you have loved ones who've died. I don't want you to be ignorant. Because if you were ignorant, you might grieve or sorrow as others who have no hope. Yes, there are people who have no hope. Yes, they grieve in a particular way. It might be observable. You might be able to systematize it into five stages of grieving. They have no hope. But Paul says they are ignorant. I don't want you to be ignorant or else you'll grieve the way they do. I did not grieve that way. It has been... 20 years almost since my wife's death. If this is denial, then long live denial. I've lived a happy Christian life in this 20 years of denial. As a matter of fact, I, there is nothing that I deny. When, my wife was, when I was told by the paramedics my wife was dead, I accepted it. Okay, she's dead. But the reason that I <clears throat> had peace was not because of some recourse to denial. It's because I had recourse to affirmation. I affirmed God. I affirmed that God is a good God. God is a sovereign God. And though he does things that are painful and unpleasant and uh, things I would not have preferred or chosen, he always is doing what is right and good for all those whom he loves. And since I am conf- I'm assured that I am one of those that he loves, then I am assured that whatever happens, however surprising or disappointing it may be to me, it is his appointment for me and it's his better choice. I believe that. I didn't have to have someone hold my hand and tell me that. I've walked with God for 35 years or so, maybe uh, maybe more. And I know God is there. The trouble is, Christians are not being encouraged to know God in that way. In fact, they're told that if, that if they know God that way, and if God really is all they need, there's something abnormal about them. They're in denial. They're not facing their deep crisis in the the repressed memories and so forth that you can only get at with a psychologist digging around in there. Uh, as, as was it Larry Crabb, or yeah, I believe it was Larry Crabb, who said that as long as Christians uh, remain ignorant about the deep roots in the unconscious mind of our problems, Christian counseling will continue to be shallow and will help very few. Uh, well, like I say, when these Christian psychologists say these things, they're not telling us much about reality. They're telling us something about themselves. That's all they're doing. They're saying what they believe is true, and how could they believe this is true unless it was true of them? A man can't say, people always think this way unless he thinks that way. Because if he doesn't think that way, then he wouldn't say people always do. He is assuming that his low level of confidence in God, his low level of ability to cope with the hardship and stress and crises of life, finding all that he needs in God alone, that his inability to do that, or failure is a better word than inability, is normative. Now, let me say this. His reactions to crises, inadequate as they are, may not, they may in fact be average, but not normative. There's a difference between what is normal and what is average. What is normal is the way that things by definitions are supposed to be. What is average is the way things basically are with most people. And in fact, this inability to find peace in God and joy in the Holy Spirit and to find the supernatural assistance that is the birthright of the child of God in times of trial, in times of stress, to to appropriate the grace of God to find him as a help in time of need, to come boldly before the throne of grace, to obtain mercy and find grace to help. The, The failure to do that on the part of most Christians may indeed make the pronouncements of these psychologists true of the average Christian, but not of the normal Christian. And there's no reason why anyone has to sink to the low level of the average Christian when they could be totally committed to Jesus Christ, trusting wholly in Him, dead to self, and going on with God and not focusing on my little hurts and my pains and so forth. Some people think if you don't focus on them, you'll never get them cured. They don't need to be cured. They're not sicknesses. Thank you. I'm not a sick person. I'm a Christian. If I, I mean, I, I, if I have a sore throat, I'll tell you I'm sick. If I'm throwing up or have a fever, I'll tell you I'm sick. But if I'm in a life that has sorrows and sufferings, I'm not going to call myself sick for that. People say, well, don't you think that Christians can feel hurt and woundedness and bitterness and 
uh, let's take the bitterness out of that let's, let's say hurt and woundedness don't you think Christians can have deep wounds and scars and so forth uh, and hurts and pains well I think that the word these days hurt usually means bitter today when we say that someone has hurt I've been deeply hurt what it means is I resent whoever hurt me. It doesn't just mean I experience pain. It means I am dwelling on that pain in such a way as to carry bitterness and resentment. That's what is almost always being described by someone saying, I've been deeply hurt by you. It, hey, listen, you're entitled to feel hurt. Jesus hurt too. When you put nails in someone's wrists and feet and hang them from a cross and stick a crown of thorns on it, that hurts. If you get hit by a train, you're entitled to hurt. If somebody rejects you or cheats you or takes something from you, you're entitled to hurt. Life is painful. It's a, it's a fallen world. Jesus did not escape pain. And we should not expect to escape pain. The question is, when we have pain, when we have hurt, what is our reaction? Do we get bitter? Do we get resentful? Do we hold it against God? Do we hold it against the people that we perceive as the perpetrators? Or do we just say, well, hey, who am I that I should never be hurt? Am I some innocent, pristine person who deserves no pain, no suffering? Am I different than others? Am I wholly innocent? Do I deserve to live a life without pain? Do I deserve to have everyone treat me right? Where do I get that impression? Not from my scriptures. Just from my ego. And... To think like a Christian and to trust God like a Christian and to appropriate grace from God and to walk in the Spirit. These, are, these lay open to the Christian supernatural resources that unfortunately, apparently, the average Christian doesn't know a thing about. If they did, then the psychologists wouldn't have so many people on their couches because there is grace to help and that grace is barely known apparently, in the modern church. I'm sorry to say. But to say that Christians must go through the five stages of grieving is totally irresponsible. It is a total affirmation of psychology and a denial of the Scriptures. Because Paul said that those who are not ignorant, the Christians that he is informing, he's doing that so that they will not grieve as others who have no hope. Sure, you, if you had no hope, there'd be reason to go through those five stages, and maybe more too. Maybe if I had no hope, I don't know if I'd ever come to resolution. I might just stay in the weeping stage or the angry stage or the denial stage if I had no hope. But I have hope, and that changes everything. I don't grieve like those who have no hope. And no one should tell me I'm abnormal for that. That's normal Christianity I'm talking about. They're talking about normal non-Christianity, and that's a different issue. I'm not measuring myself by what non-Christians do. And I don't want you to do so either or encourage anyone who comes to you for counsel to do so. You give them a higher standard. You give them the standard that God gives them. And it is reachable because although it is unreachable by human means, Christianity is supernatural in nature and provides supernatural resources that make you capable of doing uh, what God expects you to do. Faithful is he who called you who also will do it. It's his strength that does it. So those who appeal to psychology and the wisdom of man are giving evidence that Christians have forgotten, neglected, or rejected, A, the spiritual nature of man's state and warfare, B, the moral, not medical nature of mental and bodily misbehavior, and three, they have forgotten the supernatural nature of Christianity as God's solution. And, or they seem to be denying it. I think they're the ones in denial. Jeremiah spoke about the people of his day and certainly applies to those who appeal to Christian psychology. In Jeremiah 2.13, he says, God says, My people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and they've hewed out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. A cistern is a reservoir of water. And he says, I am the fountain of living waters. If my people would come to me, they would find all the refreshment and all the life that I have available for them. Living waters, by the way, <laughs> that's supernatural. When Jesus referred to the living waters in John 7, verses 37 through 39, John identified the living waters as the Holy Spirit. God is the fountain from whom spiritual, supernatural refreshment and sustenance come. 
But the people of God have turned from that. They're not confident in that. They don't believe that anymore. And they've instead, in place of the living waters, they've hewn out reservoirs, cisterns. The fresh and living stream of God's spiritual truth and assistance and, and uh, power has been rejected in favor of stagnant cisterns that, that are cracked and can't even hold water. And certainly if there's anything that we could say does not hold water, it is the theories of psychologists. As we have seen in our earlier lectures, they do not even stand up to their own research or their own testing. Why reject the truth that has sustained godly Christians for 2,000 years and longer since in the Old Testament people had the same God and were able to cope through faith in God as well as Christians have been in the last 2,000 years? Why reject that which has sustained the godly for over 4,500, 5,000, 6,000 years in favor of theories that have come up in the last century and a half which are already shown to be bankrupt? Broken cisterns that can hold no water. And yet this is from that from which Christians prefer to drink. Let me give you a more biblical perspective on the problems that people go to therapists about. Emotions like grief, sorrow, fear, anger, passion. Those are universal human experiences. They're not sicknesses. They're part of being a rational, emotive being in the image of God. God has uh, many of those uh, emotions as well. I don't know if he's ever afraid, but uh, he does get angry, and he does have sorrow, and he does have passion. Uh, these emotions are simply part of being a rational, emotive being in the image of God, a spiritual being. And the purpose of such experiences and emotions is to motivate us to constructive action of a godly sort. If you're sorrowful or anxious or fearful or angry, these emotions can be the means by which you are stirred to action in some way or another. And that's what they're intended to be. Jesus had compassion on the multitudes. He was sorry for them. So what did he do? He fed them. When people are fearful, they're to call out on God. And when the people are angry, especially if they're angry at something that's legitimate to be angry about. Jesus was angry at the Pharisees. Anger motivates you to do something that you would not do if you're apathetic or complacent. Emotions are human experience. They're not always sinful. They can become sinful. They become sinful when the emotions dictate behavior that is not agreeable with or does not conform to God's standards of holiness. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, Peter says, As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts, that means desires, as in your ignorance, that is, when you were in ignorance, before you knew God, your life was conformed or fashioned according to the dictates of habits which were in obedience to your lusts, to your passions, to your desires. But now we're not supposed to do that. But uh, it says, but as he who has called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Now, we do, by the way, fashion our conduct. One way or another, we do conform our behavior by the formation of habits. When we were ignorant, Peter says, we did this according to our passions, our lusts, our desires, our, our emotions, whatever. And this is the fairly typical of unsaved people. And unfortunately, only too typical of many Christians as well, that whatever their emotions dictate is what they do. Am I feeling sorry? Well, let me wallow in self-pity. Am I feeling anxious? Well, let me get, you know, a case of nerves or panic instead of trusting in God. Um, do I feel anger? Well, let me see how, you know, I can get at that person I'm angry at or something. I mean, to, to do something evil, something that does not conform to God's standards of holiness because your emotions would incline you to, is sin. Emotions can be good. 
if they motivate you and get, stir you from apathy and get you to do constructive, godly things. But if they are a dictator of your decisions to the point where you no longer dictate your decisions from a, high, a standard of God's holiness, then, of course, it becomes sin. Bitterness, which is basically unforgiveness. Guilt, fearfulness, anxiety, depression, anger, lust, what would be called in psychological terms dysfunctional relationships, obsessions, addictions. These are just idolatry, really. They're all spiritual and moral in nature, and they're incapable of changing without supernatural aid from the gospel. Paul said in Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation to all who believe. The gospel message, the truth of the scripture, the words of Jesus, this is the power of God for salvation. What is salvation anyway? Unfortunately, too many people, their view of salvation stops at the idea of getting a ticket to heaven. That's, you know, they get their sins forgiven. And they now have their ticket. They're justified, they think. And that's all they're interested in. But the salvation of Christ is a great salvation. And it is a, it's dangerous to neglect so great salvation. And some people just are satisfied that they feel they have their sins forgiven and they're saved. That is far from a, a holistic picture of what the Bible talks about as salvation. Salvation is salvation from sin. His name, the angel said to the shepherds, his name should be called Jesus, or said to, uh, this was announced not to the shepherds, but to Joseph. The angel said his name should be called Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Salvation is salvation from sins, not just from the guilt and penalty of your sins, but from your sins. You're a slave of sin, and the truth can make you free, Jesus said, from your sin, slavery. If people have life-dominating problems, that is sin. And there is freedom. There is salvation. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to all who believe. It's obvious that those who want to integrate psychology don't believe that. They don't believe the gospel is the power of God to salvation. Therefore, it isn't for them because that's only that to those who believe. They obviously have more confidence in something else. Now, <clears throat> it says in 2 Corinthians 10... Verses 4 and 5, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they're not fleshly. But they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Jesus Christ. Now, is that really possible or is that just kind of an idealistic um, you know, uh, religious statement that doesn't really have any bearing in reality. It just sounds like what Christians ought to believe. Is there such a thing as bringing every thought into obedience to Jesus Christ? Is there really such a thing? Is it possible to cast down strongholds and the high things that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God and cast down imagination? Is it possible? Is that really possible? Paul said it is. And if that is accomplished, where do I need a therapist to come into this picture? If there are things in my life that, that are strongholds of the enemy, if there are things in my life that are my thoughts and my moods and my emotions run amok, and they haven't been roped in and corralled in and brought into subjection to the obedience of Jesus Christ... Where is the therapist in this picture? I read that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are mighty through God. God. Mighty through God. That is supernatural power of the gospel. God has given us the equipment through himself to bring every thought into captivity to Christ. Now, I don't need a, I don't need a therapist then. Now, I might need somebody to remind me of what God has said. I'm not saying I don't need the body of Christ. I'm not saying I don't need somebody to give me counsel at times. I'm not trying to set myself up as a person who, who has a total recall and never neglects or forgets any biblical truth. 
We do need each other, but we need each other to remind us of what God has provided and what God has revealed, what God has said, not to, uh, to approach us as a patient. We need to be approached and see ourselves as responsible agents, responsible for the maintenance of our spiritual relationship with God and recognizing that when we are in emotional or behavioral dysfunction in crisis, that this is a symptom of having broken that relationship in some way, of not living according to the patterns of that relationship that are revealed to us. And what we need is not someone to tell us that we are sick and need therapy. Someone needs to treat us as a responsible agent, saying there is somewhere where you've taken, uh, you're, you haven't taken the right road here. Let's retrace your steps, see if we can find out where the biblical pattern has been violated in your life, where biblical truth has not been observed. That's what we need. Because we have the weapons of our warfare, spiritual weapons, and they do break down the strongholds. They are capable of bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. If that is not true, Paul shouldn't have written it. And if Paul shouldn't have written it and did, he shouldn't be writing anything in the Bible. But I believe the Bible. I believe it's the Word of God. And I believe that that is true. So I don't care about carnal resources that people may seek to offer. Let me talk to you about the spiritual resources that we have, the weapons of our warfare. First of all, there is the name of the Lord, the name of Jesus. Now, the name of Jesus, we need to understand what this means. It's no wonder that Christian psychologists make fun of certain fundamentalists and say, well, you just give out Bible verses like they were aspirins. Or, you know, you just use little religious formulas as if they worked like magic. Well, as a matter of fact, sadly, some fundamentalists are guilty of this very thing. When we talk about the power in the name of Jesus, we are not, and the resource that is ours in the name of Jesus... And, you know, the name of the Lord is a strong tower, and the righteous run into it and are safe, it says in Proverbs. When we talk about the resource we have in the name of Jesus, we're not talking, at least we shouldn't be, talking about some superstitious notion that the name of Jesus is like a magical mantra, which simply by uttering it, all problems go away, like waving a magic wand. There are indeed people who feel that way about the name of Jesus. They think that all they have to do is invoke the name of Jesus verbally in any situation and the devil just has to run away screaming. Uh, some people, I guess this, this view is bolstered somewhat by the fact that some people have had some success in this area. There are indeed demonic oppressions that, that go away uh, when one calls out on the name of Jesus. I've, I've talked to many, many people and they didn't know each other. They've been in many parts of the world. I, I take it this is a very common experience. I have not had this experience, but, but I, I would have to say dozens, conservatively, dozens of people have explained to me that they've had this experience, that they've woken up from their sleep and felt there was someone on top of them in their bed, but there was no visible human being there. But they felt actual physical pressure on their chest and their stomach and that there's someone there and on their neck. It's like someone had their hands around their neck choking them. How many of you have either had or heard of people who've had that very experience? Very common, very common experience, apparently. And most of the people I've talked to who were Christians who had that experience said, I could barely say anything, but I just gasped out the name of Jesus. And that's what made it go away. Now, I accept this testimony at face value. I believe that there's great power in the name of Jesus and that demons are indeed power, uh, are, are terrified of the power in the name of Jesus. And experiences like this certainly seem to confirm the notion that all you have to do is say the word Jesus and everything gets better. But that's not always the case. Remember, there were the seven sons of Sceva. They were dealing with the demon-possessed man and said, We adjure you in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, to come out. It, there was no power in that formula for them. Because although they knew how to say the word Jesus, they did not know nor have any right to uh, claim the power that is associated with the name of Jesus. And that power is not magical in any way, shape, or form. When it says that we have the name of Jesus as a resource to us, what this means is that 
I have the name of Jesus just like my wife has my name. Before my wife married me, her, she had a, a, a maiden name. And when she married me, she gave up her maiden name. And she got my last name. She took on my name. What that means is that she and I are regarded in many respects as a unit now. As one flesh. It says that God made male and female and he called their name Adam. Interestingly enough, in Genesis 5, God called their name Adam. Uh, they were two, but they were one. And the wife had the man's name. But what is involved in a name? What is implied by in the Bible by having someone's name? Well, the, the name has to do with the whole identity and status and rank and authority of the person. Some people don't have very exalted names. Jesus, on the other hand, has a name above all other names. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue can sh shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And... Jesus has a very authoritative name, the highest name in the universe. Now, I, I do not, but whatever my wife gained by marrying me and taking on my name, uh, she may have, actually her maiden name may have had more status than, than the name she took on. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that she became united with me in such a way that she and I, in, in a very, uh, in a sense that God acknowledges, and that, to a certain extent, the laws of the land acknowledge are a unit. We can become, she can write, you know, checks. She can she can make commitments uh, in my name, and uh, it, it involves me, and she has the right to do so because we she my name is legally hers because she and I are married. Adam was given authority over all the animals. I am of the opinion that Eve also had such authority, but because she also was united with Adam and shared in his name and his authority. The Bible indicates that when you become a Christian, you are united with Christ in, uh, in a sense that his name really belongs to you for the same reason that it belongs to him. It's yours. In F Ephesians chapter 5, where actually we do have the illustration of marriage used to make this very point, it says... In verse uh, 28, Ephesians 5, 28, So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So, as a husband and wife become one flesh and she takes his name and his identity becomes hers, uh, so we, have be, have been, we are found in Christ. We are of his, what does it say? We are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. That's actually what Adam said about Eve when he met her. He said, oh, this is truly bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Paul says that's true of us in Christ. We are of his flesh and of his bones. We are his body. Earlier in the same epistle in Ephesians 1, Verses 22 and 23, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, Paul says that God has put all things under Christ's feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. The church is what? Is the body of Christ. The church is the fullness of him. There is a union with Christ that, that is what Paul is referring to when he talks about us being in Christ. If we are in Christ, it means that his status and rank is in some sense shared by us, although we are subject to him just like a wife is subject to her husband. Yet, we're, we bear the family name. Now, the devil and the demons uh, are of a much inferior name. Not inferior to you, but inferior to Christ. If you're dealing with the demonic, if you're dealing with the devil and you seek in the authority of your own person to withstand him, uh, you will, uh, you'll be miserably uh, unsuccessful because your name and your authority as a, as a person yourself is nothing and is not acknowledged by Satan. But if you are identified with Christ, if you are in him, if you are of his flesh and of his bone, 
if his name is your name for the same reason that it's his, because you are in him, then when you say in the name of Jesus Christ and, and understand and, and have as the reality the fact that you are a member of Christ, you are his, he's standing there in your feet, in your shoes, and he is speaking by your mouth. That is what it means to act in his name. That's what it always means to act in the name of another. It's as if they were in your shoes and you're doing on their behalf something officially that they would do if they were there. That's what it means to act in the name of Jesus. And in the name of Jesus, there is great power. Because in Jesus, there is great power. In Galatians 3.27, Paul said, For as many of us as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. We put on Christ like we put on your clothes this morning. You are in your clothes because you put them on. We are in Christ because we have put him on. And we are clothed with Christ. In Romans chapter 13, the same idea is put in more of a military kind of uh, uh, metaphor. Romans 13 and verse 14. Well, let me read the uh, earlier. Um, Verse 12 says, The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, notice he says in verse 12, put on the armor of light. Now he tells us what it means to put on the armor of light. Jesus is the one wearing the armor. We put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. When you put on Christ... You're putting, you are coming into him. You're finding yourself in him, not resting in your strength or your righteousness, nor even in your armor. Sometimes people talk about the need to put on the armor, put on your helmet, put on your shield and so forth, or your breastplate. Actually, biblically, accurately, the Bible says that Jesus is the one who put on righteousness as a breastplate. It's he that put on salvation for a helmet. You have this armor on you because you are in him. And he is so armed. He is a mighty warrior. He is capable of overcoming the enemy. The lamb has overcome. And you can overcome in him as you, as you see yourself, as he sees you and intends you to be seen, as a member of him, a part of him, an agent of his, wearing Jesus. And therefore, when the devil looks at you, believe it or not, he can look at you as if you were Jesus. I didn't say what some people say, that when God looks at you, he just sees Jesus. That may be or may not have some truth to it. It's a classic cliche, but I'm saying something different. I'm saying that when the devil looks at you, if you are standing in your identity as, as a member of Christ, in having his name as your name, just like a wife has the name of her husband and it really is hers. Uh, then the devil has to re view you as if you were Jesus himself. And that being the case, that should give you awareness of how many great problems in life can be overcome, especially those problems that are caused by the demonic. Now, we haven't talked much about the demonic in this series. But uh, the reason is because I've, I've been discussing probably the more common problems that Christians tend to see counselors about. But there are problems that people see psychiatrists about that are very, very severe and, and that are not just a matter of, okay, uh, just get a grip you know, on yourself, snap out of it, you know, acknowledge the truth and stop lying to yourself, just die to yourself. Uh, the solution is sometimes more complex. I shouldn't say more complex because even when it's this greater problem, it's not really complex at all, but it is sometimes more involved. And that is that there is more involved than just wrong thinking. A lot of times there's another thinker in there. And it's not just that you're thinking wrong, but that you're not alone in there. And that there are demons. And uh, I am personally persuaded that no doubt the majority of persons who have been diagnosed as schizophrenic, if indeed there was any true basis for the diagnosis, and that is to say that, you know, the person is just not acting a little bit strangely and people want to control them with a drug so they say they're schizophrenic and give them a drug for that. But if there is truly, uh, biz, you know, a messed up mind that is uh, multiple personalities or 
or the person is hearing voices uh, or whatever, or voices are speaking out of them. Uh, these are the kinds of things that, of course, you know, the psychiatrist doesn't know what to do with, just calls it schizophrenic and gives them a drug. Uh, I believe that those kinds of behaviors, certainly the vast majority of those, are evidence of demon possession. And I believe that some other lesser problems, not quite as extreme as that, can also be demonic. Uh, because as you read in the scripture of those out of whom Jesus cast demons, not all of them were like the man of the tomb. Some of them were sitting in the synagogue listening to the sermon. And then had a, a flash of anger and, and began to act irrationally for a, a few minutes and until the demons were cast out of them. Uh, there are demonic problems that are not as severe as the most severe ones that we usually think of. And I do believe that bondage to uh, what, what some people might call addictions at times could conceivably have a demonic root. I won't say they always do, because I believe that the flesh is fallen and in bondage to sin, and even without any encouragement from demons, a person can fall deeply into bondage to some sinful behavior. But uh, I am not willing to rule out the fact that it could be demons in some cases. And certainly there is no relief from the demonic except through the name of Jesus. Of course, in Mark 16, verses 17 and 18, Jesus said, These signs shall follow those who believe. In my name, he said, in my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. Now, they'll lay their hands on the sick and they'll recover. There's supernatural power here. This is in the name of Jesus. They shall cast out demons. The demons do respond to the name of Jesus when it is invoked by one who actually has the authority to use it. In Luke chapter 10, after Jesus sent out the 70 and they returned rejoicing at their success in the area of casting out demons, we read in Luke 10, uh, verse 19, Behold, I give you authority to trample upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. This is his response to them saying this in verse 17. When the 70 returned with joy, they said, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. The name of Jesus, uh, wielded by somebody who has the right to use it and who has confidence in it, uh, is something to which even the demons are subject. And I do believe that many of the people who see psychiatrists ought to be seen a Christian who knows how to cast out demons or at least knows how to take authority and, uh, and uh, conduct spiritual warfare. Now, I'm not into all these uh, psycho-spiritual warfare kind of books that come out, mixtures. Um, I haven't read Neil Anderson, so I don't want to say anything uh, too specific about him, but uh, I have read books by some, and I've heard that his books, which are very popular, might be of this class too that they, they define spiritual warfare in terms that are sort of quasi-biblical and quasi-psychobabble. Uh, and uh, I'm not referring to that. I'm not talking about the Christian psychologist uh, bringing in a little bit of exorcism into his practice. I'm talking about there are specific cases that Jesus encountered, the apostles encountered, that we might encounter where people have demons. And the solution is not in the least bit psychological. It is to do with them what Jesus did to them in his name. To act in Jesus' name simply means to do what he would do in his authority because he's got you there to do it. He, if he were here, he'd do a certain thing. He expects you to do it in his name since you're here and you are entitled to the power of his name being uh, invoked by you. Of course, the power of the name of Jesus is not only the power against demons but the power of access to God. Prayer is the most powerful force in the universe, and nobody can, nobody can hope to pray with results unless they come to God in the name of Jesus. Jesus said, no man comes to the Father except through me. He wasn't talking about going to heaven. He was talking about approaching the Father. 
When we pray, we endeavor to approach the Father. But you cannot approach the Father except through Jesus. In John 16, Jesus taught very plainly about this in verses 26 and 27. In that day you will ask in my name. And I do not say that to you that I shall pray the Father for you, for the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from God. Now notice, he says, you will pray to the Father in my name. Now don't think that I am going to go and pray to the Father for you. That's, you don't need that to happen. The Father loves you. You go talk to him yourself. But you go in my name. You see, many people totally misunderstand what it means to pray in Jesus' name. They think it means just tag the words in Jesus' name at the end of the prayer. In fact, some people think that praying in Jesus' name even means to pray to Jesus. An awful lot of Christians address their prayers to Jesus, although Jesus basically told us to pray otherwise than that. He said, when you pray, say, Our Father. Uh, Jesus told us to direct our prayers to the Father. But to pray in Jesus' name doesn't mean that we address the Father as Jesus, dear Jesus. What it means is that we come to the Father... In, on the merits and the authority of Jesus Christ, because we are in him. We are accepted in the beloved. We can come before the Father on his merits and with his authority, as it were. And that we, our prayers will be heard and responded to as if they were Jesus' own prayers, because we are praying in his name, in his place. That is what Jesus said. You will ask the Father and you will pray in my name. Uh, actually, as far as specifically saying it's the Father that you address, he says in verse 23 of that chapter, John 16, 23, and in that day you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. He's talking about we don't ask Jesus for things. We ask the Father for things, and we do it in Jesus' name. We come to the Father in Jesus' name. The Father loves you. You don't have to be intimidated. You don't have to feel like you have to just talk to Jesus and he'll go talk to the Father about it. That's not what he said he'd do. Father loves you. You go talk to the Father, but you go in Jesus' name. If you ask in Jesus' name, now what that means, of course, is not that you ask just any selfish prayer you want and then tag on the formula in Jesus' name and you expect results. Praying in Jesus' name means you pray the same prayer he would pray. You pray according to his interests. You pray according to his purposes. You pray according to his will. How can you be acting in the name of another if you're acting totally contrary to the spirit of that person? Totally contrary to the will and wishes of that person. You're not acting in their name in such a case. You act in a person's name when you do what they would do if they were where you are. Therefore, to pray in Jesus' name means that you pray such prayers as Jesus himself would pray. For the same things that he would pray for. With the same confidence that he would use in praying. To the same Father that he would pray to. You do everything the way Jesus would do it. In his name. In his place. And when that is done. Jesus said there's tremendous power. There's no limits to what can be done then. Of course. When it comes to a person who's your typical counselee. That person has, is, is struggling with things that are more powerful than themselves. They're overpowered by sin. If the problem is demonic, then the name of Jesus must be invoked. If the problem is simply weakness, then prayer is the recourse. And that prayer, too, is through the name of Jesus. But additionally, we need to remember that many people are simply struggling with guilt and past failure. And and they're essentially morally crippled because they've never gotten anything resolved with God over things that they know they've done wrong and they're dragging around with them. And therefore, we need to remember that forgiveness and cleansing is available only through Jesus also, only in his name. We've read a couple of different times in different lectures in this series already. Uh, Paul's remarks in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, they're very relevant to this issue of overcoming problems and change in our lives. What did he say there? He said in verses 9 and or verse, uh, yeah, verse 9 through 11, essentially. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, Paul said, do, not, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you've changed. How did that happen? But you were washed. 
but you were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Now, we're going to talk next about the Spirit of God and his role in overcoming the kinds of things that people usually go to man for. Now, we're going to have to do that probably in our next lecture because we're going to have to wind this one down and, and continue it next time. But let me just point out here, these people are different. And they were washed. Now, there's that washing has to do, of course, with the cleansing from the guilt. Uh, the power to be different comes from the Spirit of God. But the washing comes through Jesus, through the name of Jesus, by coming to God and asking forgiveness in Jesus' name. Because we cannot really seek acceptance and forgiveness through any other name. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And we know what the benefit is of this. We know it from what John says in 1 John 1, verses 7 through 9. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, unrighteous, sinful moods, attitudes, behaviors, we need to be cleansed by those. We need to be forgiven and cleansed. That forgiveness comes, and washing and cleansing comes in the name of Jesus. And we can appeal to God only on that basis, that we come to him in the name of Jesus, asking forgiveness, asking for grace to help in time of need, by the way, I've referred to that scripture a few times already in this lecture, but I haven't given you a reference for it. That's in Hebrews chapter 4. Very important. Hebrews chapter 4. And uh, verse 16 says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. Now, you can only come to the throne of grace in the name of Jesus. You can't come on your own merits or in your own name. But you can come boldly in the name of Jesus. Why? Because he can come boldly. If you come in his name, you can come before God as boldly as Jesus can come before God. So let us go, therefore, come boldly to, to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now, those are two things. Sometimes Christians just think grace and mercy are kind of the same thing. Just different words for the same concept. Well, it's not so. Mercy is here a reference to obtaining absolution from our sins, forgiveness for sins. We have done wrong. We deserve punishment, but God gives us mercy. It means he forgives us. He treats us differently. Uh, he has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so high is his mercy toward those who fear him. It says in Psalm 103. Uh, the mercy of God is for the forgiveness of our sins. But what is the other thing? Grace. Well, grace is there to help in time of need. Remember, Paul had a thorn in the flesh. He asked God three times to take away, and God said, My grace is sufficient for you. I'm not taking away the trial. I'll just give you the grace. We come boldly before the throne of grace in the name of Jesus. And we there find mercy and grace to help in the time of need. It is not coming to the couch of the psychiatrist. It is coming to the throne of grace to obtain the grace that is necessary to help to live the Christian life in a way that glorifies God and that is normative in terms of biblical descriptions of the Christian life as opposed to modern descriptions of the average backslidden Christian, which is uh, the sad norm in the minds of many today. Now, we have some other resources, some other weapons of our warfare to consider and we will do so when we come back from our break and we'll finish this up.